All right, Acts chapter 16. Let's quit talking and start preaching. Amen. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. I want to talk about fathers. I want to talk about the legacy of a father. Uh, my dad's grandpa, his name was James Ellison Corbin. And in the 1800s, he was a circuit preacher. So he would get on his horse and buggy, and he would travel from church to church, town to town, and he was a preacher, uh, what was called a circuit preacher back in the day. And my dad is named after his grandfather, his dad's father, James Ellison Corbin. And my dad's dad, his name was Jim Corbin. My dad's dad was a mechanic, and he could build anything. Uh, he actually invented uh, a style of a carburetor before carburetors were built, and I'll quickly run out of my mechanical information if I talk anything else about carburetors, but he actually uh, was one of the pioneers back in the day to, to uh, improve motors on cars. He could sell anything. Uh, he worked in several different Ford uh, um, sales uh, positions and mechanic positions. Uh, but what I remember most about my grandfather, my dad's dad, his name was Jim. I called him grandpa. What I remember most about my grandpa is that he was a deacon in his church. He drove the Sunday bus. So he would be in charge of getting to church early, drive the bus around Burnett, Texas, Buchanan Dam area to be specific, and pick up kids to go to church. And then after church, he would drive them back home, and that was their bus ministry. I also remember that he was very influential in the church, and I also knew and that when he dealt in selling stuff, so he in his front yard had campers, mobile homes, boats, motorcycles, cars, anything that you could sell, he would fix it, sell it. I remember that he was very honest. He would not put duct tape on the muffler to hold it together. He wouldn't put sawdust in the, in, you know, he wouldn't do things that he said, hey, listen, this car, here's the good, the bad, the ugly, here's my price, and he was a fair, honest man, and that's where my dad got that. I remember my mom's dad, his name was Swin. I called him Papa. Swin, a good Swedish name, Swin Helgi, uh, he, uh, I remember, he was a plumber, and so growing up, uh, he was very much in my life because we lived in the same town, so I would spend a lot of time with him. But my mom's dad, Papa, Swin, he was a plumber, and I remember that he would help me build birdhouses and dog houses, and, and he was very kind. If you ever met a tall, six-foot, you know, 200-pound guy, uh, he was big hands, plumber, you know, blue-collar, worked hard, could lift water heaters up three stories of, you know, stairs. He could, you know, weld pipes and just carry heavy tools. Very strong. He had a pickup truck, kind of looked like a Sanford and Son pickup truck, you know. It had every tool in the world on it and, you know, everything on it with the big uh, headache rack and, and pipes and all stuff. But he was the most kind, gentle man that you would ever know. He always whistled while he worked. You know, that's kind of a lost art if you think about it. And, but what I remember most uh, is he had a picture from World War II uh, when he was overseas. He was positioned or, or stationed on an island in the Pacific uh, after Pearl Harbor. And he and his brother, you know, were, were enlisted. And, and, uh, but I remember this. I would ask him, hey, what's this picture of this cave-looking place with one light bulb hanging from the ceiling, but yet there was a pulpit in this cave? And there was about 200 soldiers seated in this cave. And so I said, hey, Papa, what's this picture? You know, because he wouldn't tell me war stories. I always wanted to hear war stories. You know what I'm saying? And he would never talk about the war, but he would talk about that picture. He said, yeah, me and another couple of guys, we felt that, the, that all the soldiers needed a place to worship. So he built a church in a cave on an island in the middle of World War II which is pretty cool, um, came back and built with his hands Northwest Baptist Church, which is still on Woodrow Avenue in Austin, Texas, built with his hands his house 
but he built the house of God with even more honor and perfection and money. Can I get an amen? And I remember if I ever spent the night over there, he would pray every night for about an hour and a half. You know what I'm saying? He was a long-winded prayer, and so I would be long asleep after he, once he started praying, I was like, all right, I got to go to sleep. You know what I'm saying? And he'd be, keep on praying. But uh, I remember the legacy of my mom's dad and my dad, his dad, didn't know my dad's grandpa, but I do know this, that the legacy that those men left impacted my life. The legacy that they left impacted me. Now, I was a pretty unruly kid, but I knew that my grandpa's would disapprove of my action because they lived a life of integrity and honesty before the Lord. Can I get an amen? I knew that they weren't double life. They weren't double-minded. They didn't go to church and act one way and then at home act another way. I knew that they were the same seven days a week. I knew that my dad was the same seven days a week. I knew that my dad would get up every Sunday morning and get up early. He, he got up early seven days a week. He, never, he didn't have a sleep-in day. Seven days a week, he's up. He would be out the door going to work. He worked hard, but on Sundays, he never worked. And on Sundays, I would find him when I would get up in the living room studying to teach his Sunday school class at church that day, studying his lesson, studying the Bible. I knew that the men in my life from a family position love the Lord. Can I get an amen? Listen to this out of Acts chapter 16. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's a little unusual just because at midnight, most of us are asleep. Can I get an amen? These two guys are singing and praying at midnight. Now, what makes it even more unusual, they were prisoners in prison having just been beaten, and other prisoners were listening to them sing and pray at midnight. And suddenly, say suddenly, there was an earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Listen, there's foundations of the enemy that he's built around your life. He's built some foundations of pride. He's built some foundations of shame. He's built some foundations of greed or lust, anger, rage. He's built some foundations in your life. He has beaten you. He has imprisoned you. He has shackled you. But even when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says God will raise up a standard. Can I get an amen? And when God raises up a standard, it usually produces singing, praying, clapping, shouting, regardless of our circumstance. Now listen to what happens. Paul and Silas are in prison. They are singing and praying at midnight. Suddenly an earthquake shakes the foundation of the prison. This is real. The physical mortar, the physical stones, the physical steel is shaken. And immediately all the doors of the prison were open. And everyone's bonds were unfasted. When we go to Polunsky, this is their favorite passage of scripture. Can I get an amen? They're like, oh, amen, we're believing for a miracle. All the prison doors were opened. All the bonds, their chains, handcuffs were unfastened. The jailer woke up. So obviously he felt secure. He woke up and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now listen to this. Paul cried out and said, Hey, jailer, do not harm yourself, for we are all still here. That is an unusual prison break. That is an unheard of set of circumstances. Do not harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for lights And rushed in, trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas say this, Believe in the Lord Jesus, 
and you will be saved, you and your, you say it, you and your household. You and your household will be saved. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and all who were in his house were saved. And that, and he took them that same hour and night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to the house and set food before them. They rejoiced with his entire household that he believed in God. Here's what happened. The jailer is doing his job. He's in watching the prisoners. The prisoners have been beaten. The prisoners are handcuffed. The prisoners are in their prison, but also the jailer is in prison. The jailer is also in prison. Can I get an amen? The prison he's in is a physical one guarding physical prisoners that can't get out. Now, the jailer, when his shift was over, he would go home on a regular basis and then come back the next day for his shift at work. But yet the jailer was also in the prison, but he was also in the prison of shame, guilt, rage, unforgiveness, doom, and evil. When the gates are open, when the doors are open, when the handcuffs are taken off, the jailer is going to kill himself. Why? Because he's in prison. He does not have hope for his future. He does not want to suffer the penalty that will come to him once his bosses find out that he was in charge and he was asleep. He was in his own prison. But yet Paul and Silas said, whoa, don't kill yourself. We're still here. You're not going to die. You're not going to lose your job. That so much shook the foundation of the, prison, of the jailer's life that the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And then his household got saved. Say this, as the father goes, so goes the household. Say that with me. As the father goes, so goes the household. The jailer, for the first time in his 30-year life, 40-year life, we don't know how many kids, but he's got kids. We don't know his wife's name, but he's got a wife. For the very first time, he comes home and he says, honey, you wouldn't believe what happened to me, but I got set free. The shackles in my life, the foundations in my life, they have been broken. I got saved. Now he led his family to the Lord. All through scripture, too many times for me to list the times, it says generation will teach the next generation. Generation will be a blessing to the next generation or generation will be a curse to the next generation. Generation upon generation upon generation is how the foundation and the gospel of Jesus Christ has spread. But too many men have left their leadership position to lead their households to salvation. Men, our first pulpit is our wife. Our first pulpit is our babies. Our first pulpit is our house. This jailer did the right thing. He went home with his religion. He went home with his salvation. He went home and said, family, can you believe what happened to me? Too many men say, well, I got salvation when I was a kid. I got salvation 20 years ago. And they've not even integrated that into their dating or their marriage or their parenting life. Listen to what it says. They brought him, the jailer fell down. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved, you and your household. Did that mean that the jailer prayed a prayer and everybody got saved? No, what Paul knew, if I can get daddy, daddy will get mama, mama will get the babies, the family will get the family, the family will influence the street, the family will influence the city, the family will influence the county, the nation, the world. If I can get daddy... Then by faith, Paul said, you and your household will be saved. Knowing that daddy would go home with real life change. And mama would notice and go, what's wrong with daddy? Kids would say, daddy's different. Kids would go, wow, dad's priorities are different. So goes the father. So goes the household. Fathers, we have to understand this concept. 
that when we die and we go to heaven, we will be held accountable for what God's given to us. We know the parables that say to one is given five talents, to one is given two talents, to one is given one talent. One is given a large amount of money or a large amount of responsibility or a large talent or a large influence. To one's given a medium level, to one's just given a little level. It doesn't matter. But we're going to stand before God. And the first thing God's going to ask Cameron is not, hey, how did you pastor Whitestone? No. That may come 20th on the list. God's going to say, how did you handle my daughter, your wife? How did you handle her? Now, I'm going to say, God, she was hard to handle. I mean, what are you thinking? You know, I don't know what you were doing. But I'm going, to, I'm going to stumble my way. No, I'm just going to, I'm going to say, Lord, I loved her all the time and all the time. No. But I'm going to be held accountable for that. What did you do with your babies? Cameron, did you just teach your son to throw a football? Did you just teach your girls how to dance? Because that's horrible, by the way. But, you know, they can dance good. I, did you just have tea parties and play army? Or did you teach them how to pray? Did you teach them the word? Of, now, I don't say that all dads need to be Bible teachers all of a sudden. But we teach from our life. Are you with me? Y'all are quiet today. Come on. Are you with me? I never saw my dad, never saw my dad hit my mom, ever. Never saw my dad bow up to my mom. Never saw my mom bow up to my dad. I saw him disagree. I even saw him go into their bedroom and shut the door and could hear them disagreeing once. I even remember my dad leaving to go spend the night at his mom and dad's house. But never once, what was my dad teaching me? How to treat a woman. Yeah, we have disagreements. I saw my dad's mom and dad kiss. I saw him hug. I saw him make up. Never saw him make out, but I saw him make up. Praise, praise God. I saw honor, I saw respect. I saw the good, the bad, the ugly. You might say, well, I sure saw the opposite. Maybe you did, but that doesn't mean you have to do that. Are we together? So goes the dad, so goes the family. Generationally, there's blessings, and generationally, there's cursings. So many times, the addict is the son or daughter of the addict, who was the son or daughter of the addict. So many times, the marriages that make it come from marriages that make it, came from marriages that make it. So many times, you can see the patterns. There are spiritual roots, spiritual seeds so many times you could see a pattern of theft in a family. You could see a pattern of deceit. In a, you could see the patterns of rage. You could see the patterns. And God says, listen, regardless of the patterns you came from, you had the opportunity to change your family tree. You can change it right now. It doesn't matter if you're 20 or 99 you have the opportunity to sow some seeds if you're still breathing. Son, daughter, forgive me. Wife, spouse, ex-wife, would you forgive me? Would you extend yourself as a man and heal what you can heal, change what you can change, and do what you could do? Can I get an amen? Listen to this out of Joshua chapter 24. This passage of scripture, both of my grandfathers, both of my grandfathers, my grandfather Swin had this on a picture in his wall. I preached this verse at my grandfather Jane, or Jim, pop, uh, my grandpa, my dad's dad, at his funeral, Joshua 24. Listen to what this says. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Say, fear the Lord. When it says fear the Lord, it didn't say be afraid of the Lord. 
but respect the Lord. Fear the Lord with honor and reverence. Amen? Therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him with sincerity, Cameron, and in truth. Put away the gods. Say gods. Now listen, this is a harsh statement. Joshua is talking to godly Israelites. And he's talking to sons of sons. Now listen, I have a lot of respect for my grandparents. I have a lot of respect for my parents. But my grandparents and parents were not perfect. One of them struggled greatly with rage and suffered a lot of consequences because of it. Lost a lot of jobs, had to move a lot. One of them suffered with bitterness that really put a chokehold on their relationships intimately with other family and wasn't delivered from it until about a year before their death. One of them suffered with identity crisis that really wrecked some havoc with the identity and security of their children. I could, I could name a lot of stuff that wasn't good about all of them. Are, are you with me? So listen to what this says. It says, Cameron, fear the Lord. Cameron, I, I didn't say fear the Lord like your dad did or like your... No, you choose. See, I don't get the religion of my grandparents by osmosis. Here's my biggest conversion to the Lord. My biggest conversion to the Lord happened on South Meadows Drive in the middle of Austin, Texas. My friend, my best friend, had just passed away. I had just graduated from high school. And, and, I, and I joke about it, but my real mindset was, I'm going to get my own house. I'm going to open up a bar on 6th Street. I'm going to rock and roll, drug, sex, rock and roll, man. It's just going to be party all the time. So my friend passes away. That rattles me. That shakes me to the core. I'm sitting on my car sometime in the night. I'm staring at this guy, and I'm asking God. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to God. I'm mad at God. But I'm also saying, God, I do not want to submit to my mom and dad. I will not follow their God I will not play their religion game. I will not go to their church and be goody-two-shoe Christian boy. I don't want what they got. Now listen, I may be a little more transparent than you, but that's what most rebellious kids do, whether they can put words to that or not. And God said, then your pride will send you to hell. And I didn't ask you to take on mama and daddy's religion I asked you, Cameron, to serve me. Will you serve me? And I'll never forget that day on that car, staring up to that sky, I just said, God, even if, it, even if I have to look like I'm submitting to my mom and dad, I choose to submit to you. Now, that may not be coming through quite as clear as I'm trying to verbalize it, But that was the day, that was the moment where I said, I'll follow God. I'll follow God. And if my mom and dad like it, great. If they don't like it, that's that's their problem. But I'm going to follow God. Are you with me? Listen to what Joshua says. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, put away the gods which your father served. Listen. Some of my fathers in my past served the God of mammon, money. Some of them served the God of addiction. Some of them served the God of pride. Some of them served the God of intellect. Some of them served the God of popularity and image. Some of them served the God of reputation. Some of them served the God of independence, my way or the highway, Frank Sinatra. Some of, I know every, I get in trouble every time I say that. Some, some of them served God's. God says, put away their gods and serve me. Are you with me? Your parents had some gods. Your dad had some gods. I have some gods that I hope my kids put away. 
I have some gods that I have served, and I have shown them me serving them. I would love to stand before you and say, I'm a perfect preacher, and my kids never saw their pastor dad ever serve. I have served as pastor other gods, and I hope my kids don't grow up to serve them. I I hope my kids grow up to serve Elohim. El Elyon, El Shaddai. Are we on the same page? Listen to what Joshua Joshua is saying to God's people. Hey, you came out of Egypt. You were there for 400 years. Now, he wasn't talking to 400-year-olds. He's really talking to 40-year-olds. He's saying, but some of your Jewish, Israelite, God-following moms and dads served the gods of the Egypt. I, I'm telling you to put those gods away. Here's what it says. Serve the Lord with fear. Serve him with sincerity and truth. Put away the gods of your fathers, which they served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you'll serve. It's that simple. If, if serving the Lord is evil, if you don't like it, don't serve him. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, the god of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for Cameron and his household, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's a father's position. Every father I know has his own house rules. Some of them are weird, some of them are normal. But I remember going to some of my friends' houses growing up, and their dad said, this is allowed, this is not allowed. Sometimes that was Cameron. Your other friends are allowed, but Cameron's not allowed in my house. Sometimes sometimes I was not allowed in their house. I don't like that kid. So I'd have to stand on the sidewalk. That's That's a true story with my wife's grandpa. Yeah. But I remember going to different houses Different friends' houses, it was okay to watch that movie. It was okay to have that substance. It was okay to talk that way. Other pa- no, you can't even wear your shoes and that. You have rules. You have gods. We're called to put away the unholy gods of our generation's past. Let's put, I'd like to put this on screen. Let's look at three L words in Scripture. El Shaddai, El Elyon. So when you see this in Scripture, El Elyon is one of my favorite names for God in the Old Testament. The Lord gave me a revelation of this about 15 years ago. I had never heard this word growing up in church. It's not that God has different names and we call him by different names. But he has different titles. He has different labels that identify his character. El Elyon means the most high God. El, before a name, indicates God. Amen? El Shaddai is the Lord Almighty. El Ohim simply means God. In the Old Testament, when you see El before a name, it's symbolizing God. My great-grandpa was a circuit preacher. His name was James Ellison Corbin. My dad was named after him, James Ellison Corbin. I was named Cameron Ellison Corbin. Just about three months ago, my dad was in the hospital, and I didn't think he would make it. I had a day where I thought, man, and I just started thinking. I just started regretting. I just started to go, oh, oh, oh. You know, you've been there. Then I started to think about his name. I never really thought about my middle name, never really thought about my dad's middle name. And the Lord just said, Yahweh is your dad's God. 
So let's put Ellison up there. When you look at Ellison, it starts with E-L. And Ellison, my dad, is God's son. Why? Because his dad was God's son. And his dad, Jim Corbin, taught him about the Lord. He didn't force it on him. He just said, son, you need God. You get to choose your God in this life. Why did his dad teach my dad that? Because his dad, James Ellison, not because he's a circuit preacher and some, he, I think he got, gave, I, I think he was a no, nobody farmer that just preached for chickens. But he loved God enough to tell his son about God. And he says, son, Yahweh is my God. My dad taught me about his God. And I'm telling you, you're teaching your kids who your God is. We are teaching our kids who our gods are. And we live in a land with many gods. And sometimes we bring them into our houses. Sometimes we bring them into our lives. But I say this, Yahweh is my God. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we will spend the rest of our days kicking out gods that would dare exalt themselves before the one true God. Let's stand. The Ten Commandments... The Ten Commandments start with this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Was God comparing himself to an imaginary thing? No. God was saying there are other gods out there. They're created, they're fallen, they're rebellious. But they'll receive your worship. And oh, they'll make you feel good for a little while. But in the end, they'll sow seeds of generational corruption. Your mom and dad, good, bad, or ugly, worship gods. My parents worship gods. Stacy and I worship. I would love to tell you we don't struggle with any other worship. But we do. And God says, put those gods away. You can serve it. But hey, Cameron, it's, it's so ingrained in you from generational past that your middle name means Yahweh's your God. My mom used to pray this prayer over me. Did I ever tell you about the time I was at Six Flags and I tried to win one of those stuffed bears? Does anybody remember that story? Just real fast, did you ever get to go to an amusement park when you were a kid? And did you ever get like $5 and you thought you were the hero of the day because you had $5 in your pocket? Well, when I got that $5, me and my friend went straight to the arcade to win the animals. You know what I'm saying? I come back in like 10 minutes, I'm out of money completely. My mom's like, I, I knew you wouldn't win. I was like, why, mama, why? She goes, because I was praying you wouldn't win. I was like, mom, and I knew she meant it. I was like, what are you saying? She goes, I don't want you to grow up to become a gambler. So I was like, that makes no sense, you know? And, and she goes, yeah, I pray that you always don't win on gambling games and you, and you always get caught when you're guilty. I'm like, thanks a lot, mom. But thank God, she was just trying to push me to Yahweh. Yahweh is my God. Who is your God? Men, let's just pursue God. If you haven't pursued him before today, today's the day. If your dad didn't pursue it, today's the day to change your family line. 
Maybe your dad's still alive. Maybe you can still talk to him and just say, Dad, man, I love you. Thank you for being a great dad. I just want you to know, man, I'm serving God with all my heart. We have a man in our church that told that to his dad who he had great bitterness and great divide on his deathbed. And it changed his dad's life. Sometimes the enemy says, oh, your dad's so hard he'll never change. That's a lie from the pit. Maybe, maybe the son is the very one who could actually change the dad. Amen? Amen.